So, um, right, so I wanted to just start by uh, with a, just a little bit of, of history. So, uh, there's an old uh, result of uh, Burgess uh, from the 1960s. Uh, where he bound it, he, so he he uh, he obtained non-trivial bounds for character sums. So so chi is a is a is a is a Dirichlet character, and and he got a bound for uh, the sum of the values of the of this character inside an, an interval, um, and so he he he, he got uh, so okay, so one of his results. Uh, so he has he, he has he has a few, but so one of them. Uh, takes the form uh, <coughs> that the bound is uh, square root of n times q to the 3 over 16 uh, plus epsilon. Um, and actually, he has uh, uh, more. What's that? Yeah, chi, chi is mod q, yeah. Uh, non trivial. And uh, yeah, so he has, he has more general results than this. Uh, so you can. Uh, uh, there's some other parameter that I specialized here. And, um, but anyway, so. So what this what this is is uh, this is, what this gives you is, is is some cancellation inside this character sum. So one of the the reasons that this uh, or one of the applications of this uh, old result was uh, to prove that there exist uh, quadratic non-residues and and quadratic residues in, in short intervals. Um, not too short, short, long, <laughs> short, but not too short. Okay. So they so for some n's, this tells you you know if n is big enough compared to q, then this tells you that this is smaller than n. And so there has to be some cancellation. So think of chi being uh, like a quadratic character uh, mod q. Take q to be a prime, and um, and so this tells you that there have to be quadratic residues and non-residues inside that interval. Um, and you can use it to prove existence of primitive roots and in short intervals and things like that. So. So this was, uh, you know, this interesting thing, and um, yeah. And so one of the one of the things that you get from this, you can state in terms of L function. So if you take a, a Dirichlet L function, uh, uh, same same chi, then this is bounded by. Um, uh, so I'm I'm not in, uh, writing anything in terms of t, uh, but in terms of q, uh, the bound is q to the three over sixteen um, plus epsilon. Um, yeah, and, and then the constant depends on epsilon. Um, and so this is called the Burgess bound. Um, okay, and actually for, uh, for general Dirichlet characters, this has still um, not been improved since the 1960s. So, but in, um, in, in the year 2000, uh, Connery and Ivaniets, so I, Ivaniets was my uh, PhD advisor and Connery was my postdoctoral advisor. Uh, so, I don't know, I feel proud of them for, <laughs> for doing good work. So, they, they, uh, so they, they, they got an improvement on this for, for, for a special class of characters. So, they proved that, um, for, so for Dirichlet characters, so if you take chi q, so for me, for me chi q, this is going to be the quadratic character mod q. So chi q of n will be um, just n over q, and q will be square free. And um, I think I think throughout the talk it'll be odd. Okay. So anyway, so the result is that this is um, uh, q to the one over six uh, plus epsilon. And again, some dependence on t, not not specified. And so one, one over six is a, is smaller than uh, than three over sixteen, and <laughs> uh, and so this is uh, 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 an improvement over the Burgess bound. So th so this is uh, so this is a, 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 a pretty big big advance. Well, okay, so that's that was why. How, yeah, okay, I forgot. I guess I got ahead of myself. So uh, so the trivial bound here, the convexity bound, is uh, q to the one over four. Uh, and so this is non-trivial. It's, it's, it, it's saying there's some cancellation in the sum. So the, the convexity bound basically corresponds to there being no cancellation in, in character sums. Um, yeah, so this is saying there's mo even more cancellation in, inside character sums, uh, at least for quadratic characters. And we still don't uh, actually have this type of bound for, um, for a general uh, character. 
So 3 over 16 is still the best we have for, for quadratic characters. Um, uh, OK, right. All right, so I was going to talk about uh, exponents. So, uh, so, this, so we call this a, a vial uh, type uh, exponent uh, because it matches the same exponent for the Riemann zeta function that, that vial proved. So vial proved uh, uh, this bound uh, t to the 1 over 6. Um, and so the, the t versus the q, they, they play the same role when you compare the zeta function in, with large t and, and Dirichlet L functions with large modulus. And so um, it's the same type of exponent. Yeah, I saw that on the archive, yeah. OK, good. Yeah, so there, there are smaller exponents than 1 over 6 for, for the Riemann zeta function. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, but uh, with those, yeah, those are special. I think you have some results for for Dirichlet L functions with prime power. As the as you'd let the you you fix your prime and the power goes up to just amongst. Okay, okay, okay. So right, okay. So actually, they they showed. Um, uh, they showed a more general result, or, or I think, okay, so it wasn't just for Dirichlet L function. So they proved that if you take uh, uh, a degree 2 L function, certain, certain degree 2 L functions, and you twist by the quadratic character, then this is uh, Q to the 1 third plus epsilon, where F here could be either a MOS form, uh, HECA, uh, HECA MOS uh, cusp form, uh, f uh, with of level dividing q, um, or it could be um, a holomorphic Hecke eigenform of weight k, uh, uh, greater than or equal to twelve, and, and same thing level dividing q. Okay, and so this one third is uh, when you go when you when you when the degree goes up to degree two, then the exponent also uh, doubles, and so this one third is like the same as the one six for the zeta function. So it's also a vial type um, subconvexity bound, and so these these vial type subconvexity bounds are uh, elusive, and we don't have them in, in very many situations. So it's always very special and and and, and interesting when when we can. Yes. Okay. Yes. So it depends on f and epsilon. So it's just as q. It it depends on it depends on the 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 the, the spectral parameter of the MOS form or the weight, but it doesn't depend on the the level. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but actually, this is what the talk is about: is how this depends on f. Um, okay. So I, I can I, I can just state a theorem, and then uh, and then talk about it afterwards. So so here here's what the theorem is. I guess I should have some notation. So uj will be a mass form, heck a mass form, uh, and then the, so it's an eigenfunction of the Laplacian. And so let's write the eigenvalue as a quarter plus tj squared. So tj is the uh, spectral parameter. So, okay, so here's the result. So what we're going to do is um, take tj's in a little window of, of uh, so capital T is, is some large number, and then we're looking at the, the, the spectral parameters that are in this little interval of length one. Um, okay, and then this is, uh, and then this is of level dividing Q again. Okay, so L of a half, uh, uj twisted by, I did I switch my notation? So uj twisted by chi q um, a half uh, cubes. And then you can also throw in um, the continuous spectrum. They sort of come together. So you can integrate from t to uh, t plus 1. And then you have the Dirichlet L function uh, to the 6th power uh, dt. And so this is bounded by um, so q times t to the 1 plus epsilon. And then 
uh, it only depends on epsilon. It doesn't depend on uh, t anymore. So it's making the dependence on the spectral parameter um, explicit. And then there's a, a second part, which, which, which is the holomorphic version. So you sum over f of weight k um, holomorphic uh, hecaforms, test forms. Similar thing, so you take um, L of F times chi Q at a half, uh, take the third power of that, that's bounded by um, K times Q to the one plus epsilon. And again, it's level dividing Q. Sorry, the epsilon, the yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, yes, the whole point, yeah, it's epsilon, not K. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Right, okay, so a couple things. So first of all, uh, the dimension of this space here in the holomorphic case is, is proportional to k times q. So, um, so the right-hand side is, uh, is consistent with the Lindelof hypothesis that all those things are bounded by k times q to the epsilon. Um, and then uh, similar thing, so the Viles law tells you that the number of eigenvalues in this little box is proportional to t times q. Um, and so again, this is these are kind of similar to each other, okay? Um, okay, so that's the, that's the res that's the, the 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 main work is in uh, this paper that I'm talking about is is proving this. Um, and so then so then there are some remarks. So I guess most importantly um, is the fact that all of these central values are non-negative. Um, so that um, so that because we're taking these this this third power, and so that means all these numbers are are, are non-negative. And so you, uh, if you want to get an upper bound on an individual one, you can drop all but one term. Um, uh, and this is the reason why we we uh, or a reason why we still don't have this file type bound for um, for non-quadratic characters. So this, this uses the fact that it's a quadratic character. Um, and so this not this uh, this thing follows from some various uh, formula, period integral formulas that prove that it prove that this thing is equal to something absolute value squared. Uh, so like a walls bouger type formula and all these generalizations of, of that. Um, Right. Yes. Yes. But for but for, for all these cases, they, there there are these other yeah other results. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> should be careful about that. It's it's uh, you'd have to follow the arguments. Th some things might go haywire if you if you take take it to be non-quadratic, but. Yeah, it's, yeah, I don't know. I haven't. I guess I didn't really look at it, so I'm not sure. Yeah, there's some. There, there are certain character sums that you come up with, and I, I can't remember if, if if they go bad if if chi is not quadratic. Uh, okay. So then, what? What's okay? So well, how does this compare to what Conry and Ivaniets did? So um, previously. Uh, what Conry and Ivanius did was they, um, so they, they showed, um, well, so let's do the, the holomorphic case. So if f is weight k, that this thing is, uh, uh, so they say that it's bounded by um, q times, oh, okay, no, oh, all right. Yeah, okay, no, I think they mentioned it for this. So they, all right, anyway, so the, I, I, I might be getting mixed up, but so Q times some power of K. Yeah, cubed. Uh, yeah, cubed, yeah. <laughs> uh, K to the one plus, yeah, okay. So Q to the one plus epsilon and then A to some power. And they don't say what A is. They say maybe we could take A equals three or, or four, or something like that. 
Um, right. So the, so okay. So then also there are some there's some other results on on this particular fa family um, in other aspects. So there's also a result of Ivich uh, from 2001 where um, he got the same result as, as the theorem, but with q equals 1. OK, so, so, the, okay, so, q, so bound with q equals 1. So the, the level 1 version. So it's just the spectral aspect. And, so, um, and he used a totally different proof. Yeah, yeah, he's looking at the cubic moment. And there are other moments that people have looked at in the spectral aspect that give you this vial type exponent. And, but this, this one, um, uh, anyway, th this is the only one that I've found that works for, <laughs> like Conrad the, in the in the, in the Q aspect. Uh, okay, also there's a, a result of, uh, of Zhao Peng which is the, the K aspect version with uh, level 1. Uh, and he, he got the, um, so it's, it's, it's this result, but with Q equals 1. So it's the, K, the weight K version of this. So it's a, a bile type exponent with, this, with the same cubic moment. Um, again, using a different method. Okay, so um, okay, so what what I did, um, so my, my proof of the theorem, what it, one of the things that uh, it does is it treats all these things in a unified way. So k and t are, are on the same footing, whether you're looking at holomorphic forms or MOS forms, um, and q they're they're all sort of treated in this all together. Okay, so the, all, all these proofs become unified. So I, I did not use a similar method as of Ivich. What I did was sort of figure out how to do Ivich's theorem sort of in kind of analogously to how Conry and Ivani is to theirs. And so then the method completely generalized so that it can handle all of these aspects together in the, in the same way. So there's, a, there's some nice... Uh, proof out there that, that puts all these things together, which, which, which I like. Um, okay, yeah, so another, another comment. Go ahead. Right. Yes, there are, that is sim Right, so there, there and, uh, in their papers, they have many, many different proofs then of, of that all give you this vial exponent. And I've tried looking at them and trying to see, well, can you generalize this to chi well, mod? Right, right, right. Yeah, I know. Well, I know. So that's why you'd like to try to use their method for other Dirichlet characters. Um, and, but from what I could tell, they don't generalize. So that's, yeah. So Conry and Ivani has hit on the right family, you know, just a really nice family to prove this. Uh, okay, so, right, so also there's a, um, uh, a recent paper of Ian Petro. Oh, I guess I should say, uh, okay, so back here. So the, this condition is um, the same as Conrad and Ivania, that the weight is at least 12. So what Ian Petro did was, um, he, he proved a bound like this, but where the weight can be small. So he got a sharp bound uh, in the cubic moment uh, for um, k, or I think he might he might just do k. I, I'm sure it works for t, but uh, I can't I can't remember. But let's just say for k fixed um, and small. So k greater than or equal to two is okay. So if you if you read Conrad Nevanius's paper, they say oh this. There's this condition, k greater than or equal to 12, and they say there's really no particular reason it's, it's at least 12. It's just, 
for simplicity, and this is this is what happens. This, this is what works. Um, however, there's uh, there if you if you really look carefully at their proof, what happens is that um, the best that they can get is four, <laughs> and it breaks down at two, which I think is the most interesting case. The weight two case is, is probably arithmetically the most interesting. It's also the most difficult, um, and so. Uh, Petro made, so that was the nice thing about what Petro did. And the reason why I, I like this is that um, then uh, you can apply this to, uh, to bounding half integral weight Fourier coefficients. So weight three halves, uh, holomorphic uh, heck eigenforms, they're, they're Fourier coefficients. So by shotgun, you mean as usual? Yeah, so, and that's. Uh, I'm. I don't remember if he gets the right power of log q, but he gets a power of log q. So there's no q to the epsilon anymore. So it's so that there's that in there too, which is quite nice. So, all right, so that's, that's the result. Um, then there's another question is why, why are you interested in this besides just, you know, we like to prove subconvexity results and <laughs> it's sort of an industry. Um, so I was actually um, interested in this because of um, an equidistribution problem for, for Higner points. So I, I, so I did have an application in mind. Um, okay, so, let's, so the application is to, to Higner points. Okay, so let's just remind you how this works. So let's say negative d is a, is a negative number, um, a fundamental discriminant. Then, um, all right, then we have binary quadratic forms of that discriminant. Uh, so b squared minus 4ac is equal to negative d. Um, so we've got this group gamma, which is uh, SL2z. So it acts on, on binary quadratic forms via uh, change of variables. And so then we know that there are only finitely many classes of binary quadratic forms. And the number is the, is the class number. So the number of um, orbits uh, is h of minus d. Uh, the class number. Okay, and then, um, right, and then now, given a binary quadratic form, you have a point um, in the upper half plane that you get by, um, by this formula, so negative b plus i root d over 2a, uh, which you get, so you just take that quadratic form, um, sort of plug in y equals 1, and factor the polynomial, and one of the roots is in the upper half plane, one's in the lower half plane, and this is the one in the upper half plane. Um, and then, uh, so gamma acts on uh, tau via uh, Mervius transformations, and uh, these are the same action. So the action um, on binary quadratic forms by change of variables is the same as um, this action by Mervius transformations. And so this just gives a way that you can sort of visualize um, uh, binary quadratic forms as points in the upper half plane. You can map them into the standard fundamental domain. Um, okay, so for given D, then you can just make a plot of these. So actually, I made a, for fun one day, I made a computer program that will do this. You, pl you give, plug in your favorite fundamental discriminant and it plots all them and uh, it's, it's quite fun. Um, Okay, and so it's a, uh, it's a theorem that these points become equidistributed as, as D gets big. Uh, okay, so this is the result of Duke and Ivaniets uh, from the late 1980s. 
so that um, so the Higner points uh, are equidistributed as d, as d goes off to infinity for large discriminant, uh, and that's equidistributed with a hyperbolic measure. So, which uh, recall means that so. If you pick a little blob here, um, you just fix your blob once and for all. Think of it as like the characteristic function of some nice set, like a disk or whatever. Then you count how many points land inside that blob for each discriminant, um, and the total. And then the, so the number should be proportional to the area of the of the blob. So if you take two different blobs, they have the same area. Count how many points land in each one. Asymptotically, they're the same. It doesn't matter where it's located. It's just Depends on the area. That's the equidistribution. Um, okay, so I was, I, you know, one of the first things that I was interested in when I learned about equidistribution is, well, like, how does it depend on your set? Uh, if you if you fiddle with your set a little bit, what what happens with the number of points? So, like, can you, how much control do you have over the set? Um, and so, often the way that these equidistribution results are stated is you just fix your set once and for all, and just and that's it. And and um, and so, yeah. So this so so, so I want, wanted to figure out what what happens. And so this that's what this following theorem is. So um, so what I want to do is be able to change my set as I change d. <laughs> so I might want to like have it shrinking. So you get more and more points. So it makes sense that you might be able to make your set shrink too in some way and count how many points. Like it's sort of like a shrinking target, you know. And you want to see how many more points you can land inside your, your small set. So um, right. So here's how you formulate this. So you have some function. Uh, let's say smooth uh, compact support. Uh, and then OK, so we've got this technical condition. So if you apply the Laplacian um, n times, <laughs> <laughs> and plug in a value of z, then I want to say that this is bounded by some number uh, v, uh, v to the 2n, uh, where v is some number that is going to grow with, allowed to grow with d. So what this means is that you've got some constants here that they, they depend on n, but they don't depend on v or d. And, and so here, okay, here's the picture. Um, <laughs> So you want to have so here's your fundamental domain, very poorly drawn, and you want to draw like a little box or something like that, okay? And you want to and you want to think of this thing as shrinking, and so what you might want to do is have it shrink in a certain way, or have it, uh, yeah. Sh so you have some other parameter v, which is measuring as v goes off to infinity, it's it's uh, it's giving you one over v would be the side length of the square, okay? And you as as v gets big, this sh this shrinks, okay? And you can approximate a characteristic function of a square like this by kind of you know, smoothing it out and making it zero, like if you go twice as far away. And what that would do is just, just make the x and y derivatives grow like a factor of v each time you differentiate. And so since the Laplacian is a second order operator, then you want, so this would grow like v to the 2n. That's where, that's where this, the 2n comes from. So if you want to capture a little square of side length 1 over v, then you can do it with a smooth function that grows like this. So that's how you think about this condition. It's just a picture like that. Okay. Um, okay. So that's the condition on this this test function. Uh, okay. So then, what's the theorem? So now, if you sum up your Higner points, so tau will run over Higner points of discriminant uh, minus d. phi of tau. So what this is, is if you think of phi as the characteristic function of a set or some smooth version of this, this is just how many, how many points land inside your set. OK. And so this is um, equal to main term. So it's the total number of points times the, 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 the area of your set. And then the 3 over the pi is just normalization so that the total volume is 1. Okay, so this is what you would expect by equidistribution. It's the main term, 
And then you've got an error term. Okay, and so the error term is, is the, um, it's the L2 norm of your function phi, uh, d to the 5 over 12 plus epsilon, and then times v. Okay, and so the point is, it's completely uniform in terms of your set, so you can allow your set to vary. Okay, it's kind of a technical looking thing. So uh, just for fun, here's, here's what you can get from this. So corollary, uh, okay, so, so fix some number um, eta, strictly bigger than four over nine, um, less than or equal to a half. So for, then for d big enough, so for d uh, large, so there are two statements. So one of them is that there exist solutions to um, this congruence, b squared congruent to minus d mod 4a uh, for some a and b with um, uh, which one do I want? So a proportional to d to the eta. Okay. So what is this? I mean, so if you have b squared congruent to um, minus d mod 4a, then that just means uh, b squared equals minus d plus 4ac. Uh, so yeah, okay. So <laughs> this is kind of stupid. So b squared minus 4ac equals minus d. So there exists a quadratic binary quadratic form of that discriminant, and it's telling you where, um, how big um, A is in this case. Okay, so it's a totally elementary statement in number theory. There exists a solution to a congruence in some range. Uh, so another, there's another part to it, uh, similar, exact same setup, except B you can force to be of size D to the eta. And there are other variants you could come up with too. This is just a particularly yeah. simple one. Yeah? Yes, of course. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. That's that's how yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. The theorem is effective, it's just the class number is ineffective, yeah. Are there similar statements for compact quotients? Yeah. I'm sure there are. Right. So go, if you, even if you go back to Duke and Ivaniec's theorem, there would be some exponent, and it would be unspecified, and it would be extremely close to a half. And so this, this eta would have to be very close to a half. And so getting it small is, um, uh, takes, some, takes some work. So 4, four over 9 is still fairly close to a half, but let's think of it as small. I mean, so, OK. So another version, which, which is effective, um, is an upper bound. So if you fix, um, let's just fix some point Z um, in the fundamental domain. Okay, then, um, so the number of Higner points um, such that, let's say, tau minus Z is less than or equal to this number 1 over V. So V now is arbitrary, it's not, okay, yeah. All right, it's just V. Um, is bounded by um, the class number uh, divided by v squared um, plus d to the 5 over 12. Okay, so it's, it's, it's much easier to get an upper bound usually on how many points are inside a little box than a lower bound. And so this one's effective because the class number is just sitting there. If the class number happens to be small, then there's also a few points inside a little box too. Um, 
It's also proportionately smaller. Um, okay. 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 Yeah, I I didn't look at it. I it was just <laughs> this just was like one line long from from the the theorem. So it's just sort of fun to plug that in. Um, but yeah, that might be good to see what the different methods give. Well, that's what this is, is the cusp. Yeah. 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 I see. Well, sure. <laughs> um, right. And so this, this one where A is, is growing, this is sort of telling you uh, there, the point, ha having the hanger points go off to the cusp at some rate. Uh, let's see, did I want to explain that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a simple thing. So the, so this is your um, fundamental domain. Then what you do is you um, look at Higner points that are at height between like V and 2V, okay? And so you can choose a, uh, if you, you can choose a weight function like this that, um, so that uh, the Laplacian applied to V grows like uh, V to the 2N. Um, basically because there's this y squared, right, in the Laplacian, and so that's what, where the v comes from. And then all the derivatives are just bounded. Um, and so then you just, uh, okay, and so, you, and so the theorem will tell you that you can get um, Higner points inside, um, uh, inside a, a set with, with certain v, and that's where this, this d to the eta comes from, is from comparing the exponents. But basically it's like just sort of a trivial thing that um, if you write down your Hinger point. So having that, this have imaginary part between v and 2v, this means that, you know, square root of d over 2a or a is proportional to v, so a is proportional to square root of d uh, over v. Okay, so usually, um, so v is just bounded, then that means the a coordinate is really big, so if you want to make a small, that corresponds to taking Hinger points going off to the cusp at some rate. Okay, so that's geometrically maybe what's going on. I don't know, it's just a cute little thing. Okay, all right. So how does this, um, how does the proof of this second theorem go, the equidistribution theorem go? So, um, so you use this, what the, the what you do is you use a spectral decomposition of uh, phi. So phi is, a, phi is a nice smooth function. So it has a spectral decomposition that you know, converges nicely. So there's a constant eigenfunction. That's the, the 3 over pi. And then you have a sum over MOS forms. And then you have a, uh, a sum with the Eisenstein series. Uh, okay, and then so e, e sub t of z is, is uh, the Eisenstein series at a half plus i t. Uh, <laughs> okay, so you've got this thing, and then now you just sum it up over tau. Okay, so. Um, it's easy to sum up a constant over the, over, over the Higner points. And so this gives, so the constant eigenfunction gives you just the inner product of phi with 3 over pi times the class number. Um, that's exactly the, uh, uh, this term right here. So that's the, the main term. So it's usually a good sign if you can somehow see the main term. 
Uh, and then, uh, then there's a spectral sum. And then uh, let's just sh for shorthand call this WJD. I'll write down what that is in a second. And then you also have a con the Eisenstein series part. W let's call that WTD uh, DT. And then that is, uh, what's that? So WJD, this is just the sum over the Higner points of your MOS form. Okay, so uh, <laughs> this might look really bad. Like at first sight, this looks really bad because you know you've replaced something you don't understand with something else you don't understand. You've got a MOS form, <laughs> which are complicated, and then you're summing those up over Higner points. So you've got two complicated things. But um, actually, no, we, this is this is a nice object. So we, there are the period integrals form for. Or there, there, there are formulas for this. So there's a, it's a Wald Bouget type formula. I think in this form, it's, it's due to Zhang that this thing, when you take the absolute value squared of it, is, um, so I think I worked out all the constants correctly. So I think it's square root of d over 2, and then it's a, it's a product of two L functions. So uj times chi, chi minus d, and then l of uj a half, and then divided by um, the symmetric square l function at 1. So from this, you can already see that um, like if we know the Lindelof hypothesis, then this is going to give something. Actually, any subconvexity bound will give you something. Because uh, if you take the square root, like this is d to the quarter, let's say. Let's, let's, let's plug in uh, Lindelof. So this is bounded by d to the quarter plus epsilon when you take the square root. Uh, and then, right. So this is d to the quarter. This is d to the half. And so this is going to win over this, uh, at least in some ranges. So you have to, then you have to sum up over tj. And that's kind of the whole point of this uniformity. So how do you sum up over tj? So this, the, it, looks, you know, it looks like an infinite sum, but in reality, you can chop it off somewhere. And where you can chop it off is, is at v. That's this basic parameter. So you can truncate it um, at uh, v, let's say v times d to the epsilon. Meaning that um, the terms where tj is, is bigger than that um, are just going to be small because the, the inner products are small. See, the idea is, so this phi inner product with uj, um, so we want to somehow exploit the fact that these are oscillating at different rates at some point, and so that this inner product is just going to be as small. It's just like some generalization of integration by parts. So what this comes about by, or you can sort of deal with this uh, using the so use the, the, okay, so if you apply the Laplacian to this and divide by a quarter plus tj squared, then you haven't actually changed anything. But then now um, the Laplacian self adjoint, so you can move it to the other side and continue this thing. And then now the Laplacian, the, the, we assume that it grows like v to the 2n. And then uj, you can just integrate over the fundamental domain. So this is bounded by v, to, v, okay, so n equals 1. I'm just doing the, ca the one case, so, or the first step. So one bound you can get on this is v squared over a quarter plus tj squared. Okay? And there's nothing stopping you from doing this more than once. So repeated integration by parts. So re repeat. And so each time you do this, you'll get an extra factor. So you can bound this by v to the 2n over um, you know, quarter plus tj squared uh, to the power n. So if tj is a little bit bigger than v, sorry if you can't see that. Um, so if tj is a little bit bigger than v, then you take n really big, and that just is, is going to be small. OK. <laughs> So 
So I mean, really, I mean, what we're doing is you're sort of deforming things in the Archimedean aspect. We're sort of trying to you know, squeeze our set, and that pop, uh, manifests itself in the spectral decomposition by having more terms in the spectral decomposition. It's like duality and in um, harmonic analysis, you know, you shrink one side and then on the Fourier transform side it, it spreads out. So it's, it's the same principle here. Um, okay, so what we need is we need to bound things like Tj up to V, let's say times D to the epsilon, times our, um, our Ws, which is a, a square root of an L function. Um, and so we, so we need to bound this, and then plug in absolute values. So we've got V, we want V to be varying v with D somehow, and we've got, so we have two different parameters. Um, and so, yeah, and so you can, you can it's, it's, qu it's quite easy to, to bound this using the first theorem I wrote down, the cubic moment bound. So you just use holders and equality. Um, and the, and the cubic moment bound. So actually the cubic moment bound is better than just subconvexity. You don't want to just count how many, just like multiply by V and then um, plug in your best subconvexity bound here. You, you actually just, um, you know, the cubic moment is stronger than subconvexity, so you can directly plug in the cubic moment bound to get something better. Okay, so that's, uh, yeah, that's how that works. Okay. I must be talking faster or something. I mean, this is than I, than I have been. Uh, okay, so I've got a little more time. So, what about the cubic moment itself? <laughs> so this is the hard, I mean, this is where all the work is in, 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 this, in, this, in this paper. Um, so here, here's, here's some of the steps. So you, well you need to bound, so if you just so write down an approximate functional equation for everything, You'll have um, your quadratic character evaluated at these three different um, integers, and then you'll have your Hecke eigenvalues of your three different integers. And the sizes of all these, the ends, is Q times T to the one plus epsilon. And I'm, I'm writing out the MOS form version, but the holomorphic form is, is similar. Um, oh yeah, and then we have to sum over Tj. Right, we're summing over Tj in a little window. So this is usually the first step in these moment moment problems. So write down an approximate functional equation. And then now you have to average over your over Tj somehow, and. Uh, and so we use uh, Kuznetsov. And so what happens is this becomes uh, a sum of Klosterman sums. Sum over C mod Q, one over C. Uh, you still have these sums over the N1, N2, N3. So the, the, these early steps are exactly the same as Conry and Ivaniets. Oh yeah, and then I didn't. And then there's some weight function. Let's call that B. So 
So if, if we were doing the weight k holomorphic case, then this would be a Bessel function of, of parameter k minus one, or weight k minus one. So, and, and then in the MOSFORM case, um, B is some kind of Bessel transform. And as a general rule, it's sort of annoying to try to, to deal with it. It's given as an integral representation. So what, what I noticed was that, approximately speaking, um, I'm, I'm kind of like specializing some parameters and, and simplifying some things, but roughly in all the cases, in the holomorphic case or the, um, the MOS <coughs> case, you can reduce to a, a, a function of the following form. So e to the 2 pi i x uh, phi of v, and then e of uh, v times t over pi dv. So there's some smooth weight function in there. And phi has, has, one, of the following, is, is one, of, has one of the following forms. So um, plus or minus uh, cosine of v, um, hyperbolic cosine of v, sine of v, and um, hyperbolic sine of v. Okay. So there are papers out there and where this type of function has been evaluated asymptotically using you know, oscillatory, inter oscillatory integral techniques. And, it's, and, and um, you want to avoid doing that as long as possible. Okay? Uh, there, are, there are lots of oscillatory integrals in this particular work. Um, but this one you want to hold off on. And it's better to use this integral representation and like save this to the end. Because what it does is it allows you to um, sort of treat all the cases together. You've, phi is just either cos or hyper, you know, cosine or hyperbolic cosine. In practice, they're, they're no different. They're just some power series uh, starts off with one. The, the sine and the, the, the hyperbolic sine are both also start off with V in the power series. And then after that, the other terms don't matter. It's just the fact that there exists some power series. So, so that's actually all you really need is that those, these functions could be anything, you know, starting with one and then the next term is, is constant v squared and sine of v is v and then higher order terms. Um, so that, that's one of the nice things about it, I think, is that you, you, <laughs> uh, you don't have to you don't have to distinguish the different cases. So if you, like I said, like in the literature, there are all these different proofs and they use different methods. So I, I wanted to try to unify them as much as possible to see what was going on. Okay. So, um, right, so the next step is uh, Poisson summation. It's, it's not a paper in analytic number theory if you don't use Poisson summation somewhere. <laughs> uh, okay, and this is in all the variables, N1, N2, N3 mod c. So, all right. Also, it might be good to look at, chop things up so that these things are close to some numbers, like, uh, let's start it like this. So let's, let's, I don't know why, why I'm doing this, but like, it might be good to localize the variables with some partition of unity and then, and then do Poisson summation. Uh, that, I don't know, that's just how it, I have it in my notes. So then you can pull out this uh, s square root stuff out front. And so then what you get is, um, ah, right, so you have your sum over C. Uh, probably want to pull that out, I guess. And then you have a sum over your, other, your dual variables, M1, M2, M3. And then you have uh, an arithmetical part, which I'll call G. And then um, there's an analytic part, which I'll call k. So what are they? So g is um, <laughs> this is a, this is what Conry Navani has encountered. So. It's, uh, it's a triple, triple sum of a uh, quadratic character. So this is a complete sum. This is all, over all A1, A2, and A3 mod C. Yeah, that's what plus on summation does. It completes the sum um, times a Klosterman sum. And then you have um, E of uh, 
a1 m1 plus a2 m2 plus a3 m3 over c. Okay, and then k is sort of like an Archimedean version of this. So I want to set up some parallels between these things. So you have some weight function depending on three parameters. It's sort of the analog of the sum over the, the a's. Uh, you have your Bessel transform, which you think of as some like generalized Bessel function uh, times your exponential uh, m1 t1 minus m2 t2 minus m3 t3 over c. Uh, dt. Okay. So everything involving G is the same as in Conry Navani at work. There's, there's nothing really more uh, to be done there. So, but, uh, but K is completely different. Like they, 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 they didn't have to do a whole lot with, with K. And so, and I wanted to try to try to compare and contrast the two things. So. Uh, you, there should be no U. That's should, probably some really bad handwriting. Oh boy. <laughs> There's no, should be no, oh this is some weight function, yeah. Some, some unspecified weight function. It's some, like in, the, in your partition of unity when I, I chopped up, yeah, the, I chopped up the variables into these different ranges. And so you have some kind of partition of unity. Yeah, I was, I'm trying to slide some of these things under the rug just because I don't have time to write all this stuff out. No one wants to see it anyway. Uh, okay, so so this one is is, is Conry Navani. So they, they they got this really nice um, partial evaluation of this character sum. So there's a there's a there's this additive character that pops out. You get the exponential of the product of the three things over C. Uh, and then some character sum, which to, okay, so right, C is R times Q. So C is congruent to zero mod Q. Okay, so this is, the H is a two variable character sum. I, I'm not, I don't think I'll write it down just for purposes of time. So they were able to um, sort of handle this thing um, using Deline's bound. Okay. So for K, it has a similar type of uh, decomposition. So it has an opposite additive character, which com exactly cancels that one, which is uh, really nice. And then there's, uh, <laughs> uh, this is, there's some other. Um, that's right, right. But then now, if, when you study this this k by um, by stationary phase, and now is when you do the exponential integral techniques. You get a dominant phase, which exactly cancels the one from G, and then you've got lower order phases. So if you um, so in their case, like th it, they sort of dealt with like t-bounded, <laughs> and what that means is that this thing, like you can basically ignore it. It's just some smooth function. But if t is big, then this thing oscillates a lot too. It's just a slightly, it could be just a slightly lower order phase compared to the first one. And so you need some additional techniques to, to be able to handle um, large t's. And so actually, one of the nice things that happens here is that um, uh, so you get you get these parameters in a block. So the C is Q times the R. So here we got, this, this is like M1, M2, M3 over R. This is in the character sum. And you get the exact same thing here, R over M1, M2, M3. So that's, that's extremely important in, 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 in the proof. Um, and you can, and so then, the, then there are parallels between the two. So what Conry Navanius do here for H is use uh, multiplicative characters to, um, to, to separate these variables, in, but in a really efficient way because they come together as a block of four variables. And then you can do a similar thing here. You use like a Fourier uh, inversion on this thing. Uh, and since these come together as a block, you do it just once. So 
So you pay the price once, but you sort of get all four variables separated at, at once. And so the same thing happens in both cases, and you can compare the two all down the line, and everything is neatly reflected uh, uh, in the Archimedean side. But uh, yeah, this g gets to be a lot more technical, so I, I, I don't think I'll uh, torture you any longer, so I'll, I'll stop here.